Now that our application is properly checking for errors in the controller, uh, let's see how we can easily display appropriate error messages to give the user a better sense of what the errors that uh, that they uh, the validation errors that occurred when they were submitting their form. So to do this, let's go back to IntelliJ. And um, I'm going to do a couple of things. One is I'm going to start my controller, and I'm going to do something that, that looks a little odd, but will make more sense once we see how this all ties together. I'm going to go to the display create event form, and I'm going to do something um, a little, again, this will seem unusual, but let's say model.addAttribute. And what I essentially want to do now is I want to pass in an empty event object. So I'm going to say new event, and uh, this uh, constructor doesn't yet exist, so let me go make it. I'm just going to make a, what's called a no arg constructor, a constructor with no arguments. And so this constructor just it won't do anything. It won't initialize any fields whatsoever. So um, I have this constructor, which basically creates an empty event object, and I want to use it here, and I want to pass in that empty event object to the view. And the reason why I'm going to do that, um, again, I said this looks a little unusual, and, and it does feel that way, at least until you get used to it is that I'm going to use this empty event object. This empty event object will have information about um, event fields. It'll know, say, that an event object has a name and a description and the data types of those fields. So I want to use that information in my template to help render my form more efficiently. So let's go into the create template. And now uh, let's start with the name field. So there are two pieces of information that are specific to this field right here. I'm saying that this input should be a text input and that the name should be uh, equal to name. So name, you know, is just the, the label given to this uh, piece of data when it's submitted. So I can use some special time leaf syntax to have those two attributes automatically generated for me using information from that empty events object. So let me go ahead and uh, wipe those two fields out. So I just deleted the name and input uh, type attributes. And I'm going to say th colon field equals dollar sign curly braces and I'm going to say event.name. Okay, so what this tells uh, Timeleaf to do is it says, hey Timeleaf, I'm going to use this, I want this input to correspond to the name field of my event object. And so please go ahead and create the corresponding name attribute and input for me. And in particular, we know that uh, for model binding, the name attribute has to match up with the uh, the variable or the field name in in the model object itself. So um, that will automatically be determined by Timeleaf. Okay, we can do the same thing down on the description. So let me say th field equals dollar sign curly brace event dot description, and I'll do the same thing for the contact email. Th colon field equals Oops. Okay. So let's start our application and uh, see see how that works. What we hope to see is we hope to see basically that the the inputs were rendered in the same way they were previously, but now Timeleaf is doing some of the work of figuring out the name and input types for these inputs for us. Okay, so everything looks okay. Let's go ahead and use our browser developer tools to inspect the page and see what things actually look like under the hood. And what I hope to see is that each of these inputs is a type text with the appropriate name attributes. So input uh, ID equals name, and uh, it's text by default, so that works. Notice that the name, that name attribute here is name, which is correct. That's the field name. And there's a value here, which is empty. Let's go down to the next one. Description looks correct as well. Notice I also have an ID here. If I wanted to use that, that's generated again from the field name. Let's go down to the email, and that looks good as well. Okay, so um, all that stuff looks great. So basically, Timeleaf generated these input types with the correct names for us. Now that's in and of itself, you know, an okay thing, but the real power in this is when we tie this attribute in with validation. So I'm gonna stop my application, and within each of my form groups here, I'm going to add a new element. And so I'm going to say p um, class equals error. I don't have an error class that's defined in my CSS yet, but I will soon. And I'm going to say th colon errors equals, 
And then just like above, I'm going to use the field name that corresponds to this um, particular input. So saying th colon errors equals dollar sign curly braces event dot name says insert any error messages associated with this field into this p tag. And I'm going to copy and paste this and then modify it each time for the description and contact name fields or contact email fields. Okay, now as I do this, I can wipe out this error message paragraph tag above because this should enable Timeleaf to intelligently figure out uh, what error objects exist or what error messages exist and what fields they correspond to and put them in the right place. Let's go back to our event controller. We'll make, um, let's see, a couple of changes. I can take off this error message parameter here. And uh, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and start it up. I think that'll be good enough. Now, notice that I'm not passing in an event object here or an errors object, even though I'm using them both in the view if, if validation fails. The reason why that happens is that those, those objects are already on the model. So this model here that gets passed into the view, that's a, sort of the bucket where we put any data that our view should know about. It already contains any, um, any models that were bound and it already contains any error messages. So those will already be available here. So when we're referencing event.description and uh, you know, the errors here, that will actually, um, th those, those uh, objects will be present in the view. Okay, so now let's render our form again. And uh, I'm just gonna submit an empty form, see what happens. Now I see that I have uh, two validation errors, three actually. So on the name field, it says name must be between three and 50 characters. That's flagging from the size uh, annotation I put on that field. And then it must not be blank. This is coming from, this is a default message coming from the not blank annotation here. Let me improve that by adding a message here. Say email is required. Or sorry, that's that's the wrong one. Uh, that well, that that's for the that's this one down here. Let me scroll up and say not blank. Name is required. Okay. And message equals. Okay, so now that should give better uh, error messages when I do it next time. Let me try like something valid here and see what happens. All right, and that works. We haven't tested our description field yet. How would we do that? We know that our description field, it can be empty, but it can't be too long. So let's just go grab some generic text. Lorem Ipsum is just uh, what developers refer to as this sort of um, boilerplate text. And so I'm going to copy a bunch of it. Does that look like five paragraphs? That'll probably be more than enough. Okay. So let me go ahead and try to submit that here. So I just put a giant string in there. Did I? Hmm, interesting. Maybe I did not get enough characters. Let's try it one more time. Five hundred characters is uh, is the validation limit. So let me. It's a different site. I can grab a bunch more here. Paragraphs. Let's go words. And say five hundred words. That should get us there, right? So I'm going to copy all this, go back to my form, paste it in. There we go. Description too long. All right. So we know description is being validated correctly as well. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, restart our application. But as we do this, notice I put in my template. I put class equals error on each of these paragraphs that's displaying error messages. I did that so I could style them accordingly. So let me go and add... Uh, some styles to my template. First, let's make sure we have a style sheet in our application. Do we have a style sheet? I do not. So let me go ahead and add one. And this is in my header fragment, which means that, uh, let's see, CSS, styles.css.
Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's good. Now I need to have that styles file. Remember that I put these in static, and I already have one there actually. Body size. Let me make that different. And let me say dot air color red. So any error messages will be displayed in red. Okay, so this is I added a style sheet to my fragment. In that style sheet, I put a rule that says the air class should get red text. And now in my create template, this each of these p tags that displays an error message should uh, have that different styling in them. So let's restart and see how this looks now. Okay, I'll go to my form and just try a, an empty one. I'm not getting my style sheet there. see why that might be the case. So under static styles.css, let's look at our browser dev tools in the network tab. Oop, see there's a 404 here on styles.css and it looks like it's looking for a styles.css with a bracket on the end. I, I think I messed something up there. Uh, let's go to, we have to go to our fragments file. Oh, you know what? I forgot the th colon href. There we go. Let's try it one more time. Okay. All right, so I just submitted an empty form again, and now I see all of the same error messages. These are, these are improved now. They're using the custom message attributes for email and name that I specified on those not blank annotations, and now they're in red. So um, yeah, just a great little uh, visual cue. This is much better than the error message before that just said, you know, uh, bad data or something like that. So this will give users a very direct um, piece of feedback on any field which fails validation.